Chapter Fifteen, Section Nine, of Capital, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Capital: A Critical Analysis of Capitalist Production, Volume One, by Karl Marx, translated from the Third German Edition by Samuel Moore and Edward Aveling, and edited by Friedrich Engels. Part Four. Production of Relative Surplus Value. Chapter 15. Machinery and Modern Industry. Section 9. The Factory Acts. Sanitary and Educational Clauses of the Same. Their General Extension in England. Factory legislation, that first conscious and methodical reaction of society against the spontaneously developed form of the process of production, is, as we have seen, just as much the necessary product of modern industry as cotton yarn, cell factors, and the electric telegraph. Before passing to the consideration of the extension of that legislation in England, we shall shortly notice certain clauses contained in the Factory Acts, and not relating to the hours of work. Apart from their wording, which makes it easy for the capitalist to evade them, the sanitary clauses are extremely meagre, and in fact limited to provisions for whitewashing the walls, for ensuring cleanliness in some other matters, for ventilation, and for protection against dangerous machinery. In the third book we shall return again to the fanatical opposition of the masters to those clauses which imposed upon them a slight expenditure on appliances for protecting the limbs of their workpeople, an opposition that throws a fresh and glaring light on the free-trade dogma, according to which, in a society with conflicting interests, each individual necessarily furthers the common weal, by seeking nothing but his own personal advantage. One example is enough. The reader knows that during the last twenty years the flax industry has very much extended, and that, with that extension, the number of scutching mills in Ireland has increased. In 1864 there were, in that country, 1,800 of those mills. Regularly, in autumn and winter, women and young persons, the wives, sons, and daughters of the neighboring small farmers, a class of people totally unaccustomed to machinery, are taken from field labor to feed the rollers of the scotching mills with flax. The accidents, both as regards number and kind, are wholly unexampled in the history of machinery. In one scotching mill, at Killedon, near Cork, there occurred between 1852 and 1856 six fatal accidents and sixty mutilations, every one of which might have been prevented by the simplest appliances, at the cost of a few shillings. Dr. W. White, the certifying surgeon for factories at Downpatrick, states, in his official report, dated the 15th December, 1865, the serious accidents at the scotching mills are of the most fearful nature. In many cases a quarter of the body is torn from the trunk, and either involves death or a future of wretched incapacity and suffering. The increase of mills in the country will, of course, extend these dreadful results, and it will be a great boon if they are brought under the legislature. I am convinced that by proper supervision of scutching mills a vast sacrifice of life and limb would be averted. What could possibly show better the character of the capitalist mode of production than the necessity that exists for forcing upon it, by acts of Parliament, the simplest appliances for maintaining cleanliness and health. In the potteries, the Factory Act of 1864 has whitewashed and cleansed upwards of two hundred workshops, after a period of abstinence from any such cleaning, in many cases of twenty years, and in some entirely. This is the abstinence of the capitalist, in which were employed twenty-seven thousand eight hundred artisans, hitherto breathing through protracted days and often nights of labor, a mephitic atmosphere, and which rendered an otherwise comparatively innocuous occupation pregnant with disease and death. The Act has improved the ventilation very much. At the same time, this portion of the Act strikingly shows that the capitalist mode of production, owing to its very nature, excludes all rational improvement beyond a certain point. It has been stated, over and over again, that the English doctors are unanimous in declaring, where the work is continuous, five hundred cubic feet is the very least space that should be allowed for each person. Now, if the factory acts, owing to their compulsory provisions, indirectly hasten on the conversion of small workshops into factories, thus indirectly attacking the proprietary rights of the smaller capitalists, and assuring a monopoly to the great ones, so, if it were made obligatory to provide the proper space for each workman in every workshop, thousands of small employers would, at one full swoop, be expropriated directly. 
the very root of the capitalist mode of production, i.e., the self-expansion of all capital, large or small, by means of the free purchase and consumption of labor-power, would be attacked. Factory legislation is therefore brought to a deadlock before these five hundred cubic feet of breathing space. The sanitary officers, the industrial inquiry commissioners, the factory inspectors, all harp, over and over again, upon the necessity for those five hundred cubic feet, and upon the impossibility of wringing them out of capital. They thus, in fact, declare that consumption and other lung diseases among the workpeople are necessary conditions to the existence of capital. Note. It has been found out by experiment that with each respiration of average intensity made by a healthy average individual, about twenty-five cubic inches of air are consumed, and that about twenty respirations are made in each minute. Hence the air inhaled in each twenty-four hours by each individual is about seven hundred twenty thousand cubic inches, or four hundred and sixteen cubic feet. It is clear, however, that air which has been once breathed can no longer serve for the same purpose, until it has been purified in the great workshop of nature. According to the experiments of Valentin and Brunner, it appears that a healthy man gives off about 1,300 cubic inches of carbonic acid per hour. This would give about eight ounces of solid carbon thrown off from the lungs in twenty-four hours. Every man should have at least 800 cubic feet. Huxley. End note. Paltry as the education clauses of the Act appear on the whole, yet they proclaim elementary education to be an indispensable condition to the employment of children. The success of those clauses proved for the first time the possibility of combining education and gymnastics with manual labor, and consequently of combining manual labor with education and gymnastics. The factory inspectors soon found out, by questioning the schoolmasters, that the factory children, although receiving only one-half the education of the regular day scholars, yet learnt quite as much, and often more. Note. According to the English Factory Act, parents cannot send their children under fourteen years of age into factories under the control of the Act, unless at the same time they allow them to receive elementary education. The manufacturer is responsible for compliance with the Act. Factory education is compulsory, and it is a condition of labor. Report of the Inspector of Factories, 31st October, 1865, page 111. End note. Note. On the very advantageous results of combining gymnastics and drilling, in the case of boys, with compulsory education for factory children and pauper scholars, see the speech of N. W. Sr. at the Seventh Annual Congress of the National Association for the Promotion of Social Science, in Report of Proceedings, etc., London, 1863, and also the Report of Inspector of Factories, 31st October, 1865. End note. This can be accounted for by the simple fact that, with only being at school for one half of the day, they are always fresh, and nearly always ready and willing to receive instruction. The system on which they work, half manual labor and half school, renders each employment a rest and relief to the other. Consequently, both are far more congenial to the child than would be the case were he kept constantly at one. It is quite clear that a boy who has been at school all the morning cannot, in hot weather particularly, cope with one who comes fresh and bright from his work. Note. Report of the Inspector of Factories, 31st October, 1865. A silk manufacturer naively states to the Children's Employment Commissioners, I am quite sure that the true secret of producing efficient work people is to be found in uniting education and labor from a period of childhood. Of course the occupation must not be too severe, nor irksome, or unhealthy. But of the advantage of the union I have no doubt. I wish my own children could have some work as well as play to give variety to their schooling. End note. Further information on this point will be found in Senior's speech at the Social Science Congress at Edinburgh in 1863. He there shows, amongst other things, how the monotonous and uselessly long school hours of the children of the upper and middle classes uselessly add to the labor of the teacher, while he not only fruitlessly but absolutely injuriously wastes the time, health, and energy of the children. From the factory system budded, as Robert Owen has shown us in detail, the germ of the education of the future, an education that will, in the case of every child over a given age, combine productive labor with instruction in gymnastics, not only as one of the methods of adding to the efficiency of production, but as the only method of producing fully developed human beings. Note, Senior, page 66 how modern industry, when it has attained to a certain pitch, is capable, by the revolution it effects in the mode of production and in the social conditions of production, 
of also revolutionizing people's minds, is strikingly shown by a comparison of Senior's speech in 1863 with his Philippic against the Factory Act of 1833, or by a comparison of the views of the Congress above referred to with the fact that in certain country districts of England poor parents are forbidden, on pain of death by starvation, to educate their children. Thus, for example, Mr. Snell reports it to be a common occurrence in Somersetshire that when a poor person claims parish relief, he is compelled to take his children from school. Mr. Woolerton, the clergyman at Feltham, also tells of cases where all relief was denied to certain families because they were sending their children to school. End note. Modern industry, as we have seen, sweeps away by technical means the manufacturing division of labor, under which each man is bound hand and foot for life to a single detail operation. At the same time, the capitalistic form of that industry reproduces this same division of labor in a still more monstrous shape, in the factory proper, by converting the workman into a living appendage of the machine, and everywhere outside the factory, partly by the sporadic use of machinery and machine workers, partly by re-establishing the division of labor on a fresh basis, by the general introduction of the labor of women and children, and of cheap, unskilled labor. Note. Wherever handicraft machines, driven by men, compete directly or indirectly with more developed machines, driven by mechanical power, a great change takes place with regard to the laborer who drives the machine. At first the steam engine replaces this laborer, afterwards he must replace the steam engine. Consequently, the tension and the amount of labor power expended become monstrous, and especially so in the case of the children who are condemned to this torture. Thus Mr. Long, one of the commissioners, found in Coventry in the neighborhood, boys of from ten to fifteen years employed in driving the ribbon looms, not to mention younger children who had to drive smaller machines. It is extraordinarily fatiguing work. The boy is a mere substitute for seam power. Employment Commission 5, Report, 1866, page 114. As to the fatal consequences of this system of slavery, as the official report styles it, see page 114. End note. The antagonism between the manufacturing division of labor and the methods of modern industry makes itself forcibly felt. It manifests itself, amongst other ways, in the frightful fact that a great part of the children employed in modern factories and manufacturers are from their earliest years riveted to the most simple manipulations, and exploited for years, without being taught a single sort of work that would afterwards make them of use, even in the same manufactory or factory. In the English letterpress printing trade, for example, there existed formerly a system, corresponding to that in the old manufactures and handicrafts, of advancing the apprentices from easy to more and more difficult work. They went through a course of teaching till they were finished printers. To be able to read and write was, for every one of them, a requirement of their trade. All this was changed by the printing machine. It employs two sorts of laborers, one grown up, renters, the other, boys, mostly from eleven to seventeen years of age, whose sole business is either to spread the sheets of paper under the machine, or to take from it the printed sheets. They perform this weary task, in London especially, for fourteen, fifteen, and sixteen hours at a stretch, during several days in the week, and frequently for thirty-six hours, with only two hours' rest for meals and sleep. A great part of them cannot read, and they are, as a rule, utter savages, and very extraordinary creatures." To qualify them for the work which they have to do, they require no intellectual training, there is little room in it for skill, and less for judgment. Their wages, though rather high for boys, do not increase proportionately as they grow up, and the majority of them cannot look for advancement to the better paid and more responsible post of machine-minder, because while each machine has but one minder, it has at least two, and often four boys attached to it. As soon as they get too old for such child's work, that is, about seventeen at the latest, they are discharged from the printing establishments. They become recruits of crime. Several attempts to procure them employment elsewhere were rendered of no avail by their ignorance and brutality, and by their mental and bodily degradation. As with the division of labor in the interior of the manufacturing workshops, so it is with the division of labor in the interior of society. So long as handicraft and manufacturer form the general groundwork of social production, the subjection of the producer to one branch exclusively, the breaking up of the multifariousness of his employment, is a necessary step in the development. On that groundwork, each separate branch of production acquires empirically the form that is technically suited to it, slowly perfects it, and so soon as a given degree of maturity has been reached, rapidly crystallizes that form. 
The only thing that here and there causes a change, besides new raw materials supplied by commerce, is the gradual alteration of the instruments of labor. But their form, too, once definitely settled by experience, petrifies, as is proved by their being in many cases handed down in the same form by one generation to another during thousands of years. A characteristic feature is, that even down into the eighteenth century the different trades were called mysteries, into their secrets none but those duly initiated could penetrate. Modern industry rent the veil that concealed from men their own social process of production, and that turned the various spontaneously divided branches of production into so many riddles, not only to outsiders, but even to the initiated. The principle which it pursued, of resolving each process into its constituent movements, without any regard to their possible execution by the hand of man, created the new modern science of technology. The varied, apparently unconnected, and petrified forms of the industrial processes now resolved themselves into so many conscious and systematic applications of natural science to the attainment of given useful effects. Technology also discovered the few main fundamental forms of motion, which, despite the diversity of instruments used, are necessarily taken by every productive action of the human body, just as the science of mechanics sees in the most complicated machinery nothing but the continual repetition of the simple mechanical powers. Note. In the celebrated Livre des Métiers of Etienne Beaulieu, we find it prescribed that a journeyman, on being admitted among the masters, had to swear to love his brethren with brotherly love, to support them in their respective trades, not willfully to betray the secrets of the trade, and besides, in the interest of all, not to recommend his own wares by calling the attention of the buyer to defects in the articles made by others. End note. Modern industry never looks upon and treats the existing form of a process as final. The technical basis of that industry is therefore revolutionary, while all earlier modes of production were essentially conservative. By means of machinery, chemical processes, and other methods, it is continually causing changes not only in the technical basis of production, but also in the functions of the laborer, and in the social combinations of the labor process. At the same time, it thereby also revolutionizes the division of labor within the society, and incessantly launches masses of capital and of workpeople from one branch of production to another. But if modern industry, by its very nature, therefore necessitates variation of labor, fluency of function, universal mobility of the laborer, on the other hand, in its capitalistic form, it reproduces the old division of labor with its ossified particularizations. We have seen how this absolute contradiction between the technical necessities of modern industry and the social character inherent in its capitalistic form dispels all fixity and security in the situation of the laborer how it constantly threatens by taking away the instruments of labor to snatch from his hand all his means of subsistence and by suppressing his detail function to make him superfluous we have seen too how this antagonism vents its rage in the creation of that monstrosity an industrial reserve army kept miserly in order to be always at the disposal of capital in the incessant human sacrifices from among the working class in the most reckless squandering of labor-power and in the devastation caused by a social anarchy which turns every economic progress into a social calamity. This is the negative side. But if, on the one hand, variation of work at present imposes itself after the manner of an overpowering natural law, and with the blindly destructive action of a natural law that meets with resistance at all points, modern industry, on the other hand, through its catastrophes imposes the necessity of recognizing, as a fundamental law of production, variation of work, consequently fitness of the laborer for varied work, consequently the greatest possible development of his varied aptitudes. It becomes a question of life and death for society to adapt the mode of production to the normal functioning of this law. Modern industry, indeed, compels society, under penalty of death, to replace the detail worker of to-day, grappled by lifelong repetition of one and the same trivial operation, and thus reduced to the mere fragment of a man, by the fully developed individual, fit for a variety of laborers, ready to face any change of production, and to whom the different social functions he performs are but so many modes of giving free scope to his own natural and acquired powers. Note. The bourgeoisie cannot exist without continually revolutionizing the instruments of production, and thereby the relations of production and all the social relations. Conservation, in an unaltered form, of the old modes of production was, on the contrary, the first condition of existence for all earlier industrial classes. 
constant revolution in production, uninterrupted disturbance of all social conditions, everlasting uncertainty and agitation, distinguish the bourgeois epoch from all earlier ones. All fixed, fast-frozen relations, with their train of ancient and venerable prejudices and opinions, are swept away. All new-formed ones become antiquated before they can ossify. All that is solid melts into air, all that is holy is profaned, and man is at last compelled to face, with sober senses, his real conditions of life, and his relations with his kind. Friedrich Ingels and Karl Marx, Manifest der Kommunischen Partei, London, 1848, page 5. End note. Note. You take my life when you do take the means whereby I live. Shakespeare. End note. Note. A French workman, on his return from San Francisco, writes as follows. I never could have believed that I was capable of working at the various occupations I was employed on in California. I was firmly convinced that I was fit for nothing but letter-press printing. Once in the midst of this world of adventurers, who change their occupation as often as they do their shirt, egad, I did as the others. As mining did not turn out remunerative enough, I left it for the town, where in succession I became topographer, slater, plumber, etc. In consequence of thus finding out that I am fit to any sort of work, I feel less of a mollusk and more of a man. A. Corbin, De l'Ensemble Professionnel, Deuxième Edition, page 50. End note. One step already spontaneously taken towards effecting this revolution is the establishment of technical and agricultural schools, and of École d'Ensemble Professionnel, in which the children of the working men receive some little instruction in technology and in the practical handling of the various implements of labor. Though the Factory Act, that first and meagre concession wrung from capital, is limited to combining elementary education with work in the factory, there can be no doubt that when the working class comes into power, as inevitably it must, technical instruction, both theoretical and practical, will take its proper place in the working class schools. There is also no doubt that such revolutionary ferments, the final result of which is the abolition of the old division of labor, are diametrically opposed to the capitalistic form of production, and to the economic status of the laborer corresponding to that form. But the historical development of the antagonisms, imminent in a given form of production, is the only way in which that form of production can be dissolved and a new form established. Nesuder ultra crepidam, this net plus ultra of handicraft wisdom became sheer nonsense, from the moment the watchmaker Watt invented the steam engine, the barber Arkwright, the throstle, and the working jeweler, Fulton, the steamship. Note. John Bellers, a very phenomenon in the history of political economy, saw most clearly at the end of the seventeenth century the necessity for abolishing the present system of education and division of labor, which beget hypertrophy and atrophy at the two opposite extremities of society. Amongst other things he says this, an idle learning being little better than the learning of idleness, bodily labor, it's a primitive institution of God, labor being as proper for the body's health as eating is for its living, for what pains a man saves by ease, he will find in disease. Labor adds oil to the lamp of life, when thinking inflames it, a childish, silly employ. A warning this, by presentiment, against the Baysdows and their modern imitators, leaves the children's minds silly. Proposals for raising a collage of industry of all useful trades and husbandry. London, 1696. End note. So long as factory legislation is confined to regulating the labor in factories, manufactories, etc., it is regarded as a mere interference with the exploiting rights of capital. But when it comes to regulating the so-called home labor, it is immediately viewed as a direct attack on the patria potestis, on parental authority. This sort of labor goes on mostly in small workshops, as we have seen in the lace-making and straw-plating trades, and as could be shown in more detail from the metal trades of Sheffield, Birmingham, etc., the tender-hearted English Parliament long affected to shrink from taking this step. The force of facts, however, compelled it at last to acknowledge that modern industry, in overturning the economic foundation on which was based the traditional family, and the family labor corresponding to it, had also unloosened all traditional family ties. The rights of the children had to be proclaimed. The final report of the Employment Commission of 1866 states, it is, unhappily, to a painful degree, apparent throughout the whole of the evidence, that against no persons do the children of both sexes so much require protection as against their parents. 
the system of unlimited exploitation of children's labor in general, and the so-called home labor in particular, is maintained only because the parents are able, without check or control, to exercise this arbitrary and mischievous power over their young and tender offspring. Parents must not possess the absolute power of making their children mere machines to earn so much weekly wage. The children and young persons, therefore, in all such cases, may justifiably claim from the legislature, as a natural right, that an exemption should be secured to them, from what destroys prematurely their physical strength, and lowers them in the scale of intellectual and moral beings. It was not, however, the misuse of parental authority that created the capitalistic exploitation, whether direct or indirect, of children's labor, but on the contrary it was the capitalistic mode of exploitation which, by sweeping away the economic basis of parental authority, made its exercise degenerate into a mischievous misuse of power, however terrible and disgusting the dissolution under the capitalist system of the old family ties may appear nevertheless modern industry by assigning as it does an important part in the process of production outside the domestic sphere to women to young persons and to children of both sexes creates a new economic foundation for a higher form of the family and of the relations between the sexes it is of course just as absurd to hold the teutonic christian form of the family to be absolute and final as it would be to apply that character to the ancient roman the ancient greek or the eastern forms which moreover taken together form a series in historical development moreover it is obvious that the fact of the collective working group being composed of individuals of both sexes and all ages must necessarily under suitable conditions become a source of humane development although in its spontaneously developed brutal capitalistic form where the labourer exists for the process of production and not the process of production for the labourer that fact is a pestiferous source of corruption and slavery factory labour may be as pure and as excellent as domestic labour and perhaps more so the necessity for a generalization of the factory acts, for transforming them from an exceptional law relating to mechanical spinning and weaving, those first creations of machinery, into a law affecting social production as a whole, arose, as we have seen, from the mode in which modern industry was historically developed. In the rear of that industry, the traditional form of manufacture, of handicraft, and of domestic industry is entirely revolutionized, manufacturers are constantly passing into the factory system and handicrafts into manufactures and lastly the sphere of handicraft and of the domestic industries become in a comparatively speaking wonderfully short time dens of misery in which capitalistic exploitation obtains free play for the wildest excesses there are two circumstances that finally turn the scale first the constantly recurring experience that capital so soon as it finds itself subject to legal control at one point compensates itself all the more recklessly at other points secondly the cry of the capitalists for equality in the conditions of competition i e for equal restraint on all exploitation of labour numerous instances will be found in the report of inspectors of factories on this point let us listen to two heartbroken cries Messrs. Cooksley of Bristol, Nail and Chain, etc., manufacturers, spontaneously introduced the regulations of the Factory Act into their business. As the old irregular system prevails in neighbouring works, the Messrs. Cooksley are subject to the disadvantage of having their boys enticed to continue their labour elsewhere after 6 p.m. This, they naturally say, is an injustice and loss to us, as it exhausts a portion of the boys' strength, of which we ought to have the full benefit. Mr. J. Simpson, paper-box and bag-maker, London, states before the commissioners of the Employment Commission, he would sign any petition for it, legislative interference. As it was, he always felt restless at night, when he had closed his place, lest others should be working later than him and getting away his orders. Summarizing, the Employment Commission says, it would be unjust to the larger employers that their factories should be placed under regulation, while the hours of labor in the smaller places in their own branch of business were under no legislative restriction. And to the injustice arising from the unfair conditions of competition, in regard to hours that would be created if the smaller places of work were exempt, would be added the disadvantage to the larger manufacturers of finding their supply of juvenile and female labor drawn off to the places of work exempt from legislation." Further, a stimulus would be given to the multiplication of the smaller places of work, which are almost invariably the least favourable to the health, comfort, education, and general improvement of the people. 
In its final report the Commission proposes to subject to the Factory Act more than 1,400,000 children, young persons, and women, of which number about one-half are exploited in small industries and by the so-called home work. The trades proposed to be brought under the Act were the following. Lace-making, stocking-weaving, straw-plating, the manufacture of wearing apparel with its numerous subdivisions, artificial flower-making, shoe-making, hat-making, glove-making, tailoring, all metal-works, from blast furnaces down to needle-works, etc., paper-mills, glass-works, tobacco-factories, india-rubber-works, braid-making, for weaving, hand-carpet-making, umbrella and parasol-making, the manufacture of spindles and spools, letter-press printing, book-binding, manufacture of stationery, including paper-bags, cards, colored paper, etc., rope-making, manufacture of jet ornaments, brick-making, silk manufacture by hand, coventry weaving, salt works, tallow chandlers, cement works, sugar refineries, biscuit making, various industries connected with timber, and other mixed trades. It says, But if it should seem fit to Parliament to place the whole of that large number of children, young persons and females, under the protective legislation above averted to, it cannot be doubted that such legislation would have a most beneficial effect, not only upon the young and the feeble, who are its most immediate objects, but upon the still larger body of adult workers, who would in all these employments, both directly and indirectly, come immediately under its influence. It would enforce upon them regular and moderate hours, it would lead to their places of work being kept in a healthy and cleanly state, it would therefore husband and improve the store of physical strength on which their own well-being, and that of the country, so much depends, it would save the rising generation from that over-exertion at an early age, which undermines their constitution and leads to premature decay. Finally, it would ensure them, at least up to the age of thirteen, the opportunity of receiving the elements of education, and would put an end to that utter ignorance, go faithfully exhibited in the reports of our assistant commissioners, and which cannot be regarded without the deepest pain, and a profound sense of national degradation." The Tory cabinet announced in the speech from the throne, on February 5, 1867, that it had framed the proposals of the Industrial Commission of Inquiry into bills. Note. The Factory Acts Extension Act was passed on August 12, 1867. It regulates all foundries, smithies, and metal manufactories, including machine shops, furthermore, glass works, paper mills, gutta percha and India rubber works, tobacco manufactories, letter-press printing and book-binding works, and lastly, all workshops in which more than fifty persons are employed. The Hours of Labor Regulation Act, passed on August 17, 1867, regulates the smaller workshops and the so-called domestic industries. I shall revert to these acts and to the new Mining Act of 1872 in Volume 2. End note. To get that far, another twenty years of experimentum in corpore vile had been required. Already in 1840 a parliamentary commission of inquiry on the labor of children had been appointed. Its report in 1842 unfolded, in the words of Nassau W. Sr., the most frightful picture of avarice, selfishness, and cruelty on the part of masters and of parents, and of juvenile and infantile misery, degradation and destruction ever presented. It may be supposed that it describes the horrors of a past age. But there is, unhappily, evidence that those horrors continued as intense as they were. A pamphlet published by Hardwick about two years ago states that the abuses complained of in 1842 are in full bloom at the present day. It is a strange proof of the general neglect of the morals and health of the children of the working class that this report lay unnoticed for twenty years, during which the children, bred up without the remotest sign of comprehension as to what is meant by the term morals, who had neither knowledge nor religion nor natural affection, were allowed to become the parents of the present generation. Senior, Social Science Congress, pages 55 through 58. The social conditions having undergone a change, Parliament could not venture to shelve the demands of the Commission of 1862, as it had done those of the Commission of 1840. Hence, in 1864, when the Commission had not yet published more than a part of its reports, the earthenware industries, including the potteries, makers of paper hangings, matches, cartridges, and caps, and fustian cutters were made subject to the acts in force in the textile industries. In the speech from the throne, on the 5th February, 1867, the Tory cabinet of the day announced the introduction of bills, founded on the final recommendations of the Commission, which had completed its labors in 1866. On the 15th of August, 1867, the Factory Acts Extension Act, and on the 21st August, the Workshops Regulation Act, received the royal assent, the former act having reference to large industries, the latter to small. 
The former applies to blast furnaces, iron and copper mills, foundries, machine shops, metal manufactories, gutta perch works, paper mills, glass works, tobacco manufactories, letter press printing, including newspapers, book binding, in short, to all industrial establishments of the above kind, in which fifty individuals or more are occupied simultaneously, and for not less than one hundred days during the year. To give an idea of the extent of the sphere embraced by the Workshops Regulation Act in its application, we cite from its interpretation clause the following passages. Handicraft shall mean any manual labor exercised by way of trade, or for purposes of gain in, or incidental to, the making any article or part of an article, or in, or incidental to, the altering, repairing, ornamenting, finishing, or otherwise adapting for sale any article. Workshop shall mean any room or place whatever in the open air or under cover, in which any handicraft is carried on by any child, young person, or woman, and of which and over which the person by whom such child, young person, or woman is employed has the right of access and control. Employed shall mean occupied in any handicraft, whether for wages or not, under a master or under a parent, as herein defined. Parent shall mean parent, guardian, or person, having the custody of, or control over, any child or young person. Clause 7, which imposes a penalty for employment of children, young persons and women, contrary to the provisions of the Act, subjects to fines, not only the occupier of the workshop, whether parent or not, but even the parent of, or the persons deriving any direct benefit from the labor of, or having the control over, the child, young person, or woman. The Factory Acts Extension Act, which affects the large establishments, derogates from the Factory Act by a crowd of vicious exceptions, and cowardly compromises with the masters. The Workshops Regulation Act, wretched in all its details, remained a dead letter in the hands of the municipal and local authorities who were charged with its execution. When, in 1871, Parliament withdrew from them this power, in order to confer it on the factory inspectors, to whose province it thus added, by a single stroke, more than one hundred thousand workshops, and three hundred brickworks, care was taken at the same time not to add more than eight assistants to their already undermanned staff. Note. The personnel of this staff consisted of two inspectors, two assistant inspectors, and forty-one sub-inspectors. Eight additional sub-inspectors were appointed in 1871. The total cost of administering the acts in England, Scotland, and Ireland amounted, for the year 1871-72, to 72, to no more than £25,347, inclusive of the law expenses incurred by prosecutions of offending masters. End note. What strikes us, then, in the English legislation of 1867, is, on the one hand, the necessity imposed on the Parliament of the ruling classes, of adopting in principle measures so extraordinary, and on so great a scale, against the excesses of capitalistic exploitation, and, on the other hand, the hesitation, the repugnance, and the bad faith which which it lent itself to the task of carrying those measures into practice. The Inquiry Commission of 1862 also proposed a new regulation of the mining industry, an industry distinguished from others by the exceptional characteristic that the interests of landlord and capitalists there join hands. The antagonism of these two interests had been favorable to factory legislation, while, on the other hand, the absence of that antagonism is sufficient to explain the delays and chicanery of the legislation on mines. The Inquiry Commission of 1840 had made revelations so terrible, so shocking, and creating such a scandal all over Europe, that to salve its conscience Parliament passed the Mining Act of 1842, in which it limited itself to forbidding the employment underground in mines of children under ten years of age and females. Then another act, the Mines Inspecting Act of 1860, provides that mines shall be inspected by public officers nominated specially for that purpose, and that boys between the ages of ten and twelve years shall not be employed, unless they have a school certificate, or go to school for a certain number of hours. This act was a complete dead letter, owing to the ridiculously small number of inspectors, the meagerness of their powers, and other causes that will become apparent as we proceed. One of the most recent blue books on mines is the report from the Select Committee on Mines, together with Evidence, 23rd July, 1866. This report is the work of a parliamentary committee selected from members of the House of Commons, and authorized to summon and examine witnesses. It is a thick folio volume in which the report itself occupies only five lines to this effect, that the committee has nothing to say, and that more witnesses must be examined. 
The mode of examining the witnesses reminds one of the cross-examination of witnesses in English courts of justice, where the advocate tries, by means of impudent, unexpected, and equivocal and involved questions, put without connection, to intimidate, surprise, and confound the witness, and to give a forced meaning to the answers extorted from him. In this inquiry the members of the committee themselves are the cross-examiners, and among them are to be found both mine-owners and mine-exploiters. The witnesses are mostly working coal-miners. The whole farce is too characteristic of the spirit of capital not to call for a few extracts from this report. For the sake of conciseness I have classified them. I may also add that every question and its answer are numbered in the English blue books. 1. Employment in mines of boys of ten years and upwards. In the mines the work, inclusive of going and returning, usually lasts fourteen or fifteen hours, sometimes even from three, four, and five o'clock a.m. till five and six o'clock p.m. The adults work in two shifts of eight hours each, but there is no alternation with the boys on account of the expense. The younger boys are chiefly employed in opening and shutting the ventilating doors in the various parts of the mine. The older ones are employed on heavier work, in carrying coal, etc. They work these long hours underground until their eighteenth or twenty-second year, when they are put to miners' work proper. Children and young persons are at present worse treated and harder worked than at any previous period. The miners demand almost unanimously an act of Parliament prohibiting the employment in mines of children under fourteen. And now Hussey Vivian, himself an exploiter of mines, asks, Would not the opinion of the workmen depend upon the poverty of the workman's family? Mr. Bruce, do you not think it would be a very hard case, where a parent had been injured, or where he was sickly, or where a father was dead, and there was only a mother, to prevent a child between twelve and fourteen earning one shilling seven pence a day for the good of the family? You must lay down a general rule. Are you prepared to recommend legislation which would prevent the employment of children under twelve and fourteen, whatever the state of their parents might be? Yes. Vivian. Supposing that an enactment were passed preventing the employment of children under the age of fourteen, would it not be probable that the parents of the children would seek employment for their children in other directions, for instance, in manufacture? Not generally, I think. Kennard. Some of the boys are keeper of doors? Yes. Is there not generally a very great draught every time you open a door or close it? Yes, generally there is. It sounds a very easy thing, but it is in fact a rather painful one. He is imprisoned there just the same as if he was in a cell of jail. Bourgeois Vivian. Whenever a boy is furnished with a lamp, cannot he read? Yes, he can read, if he finds himself in candles. I suppose he would be found fault with if he were discovered reading. He is there to mind his business. He has a duty to perform, and he has to attend to it in the first place, and I do not think it would be allowed down the pit. 2. Education. The working miners want a law for the compulsory education of their children, as in factories. They declare the clauses of the Act of 1860, which require a school certificate to be obtained before employing boys of ten and twelve years of age, to be quite illusory. The examination of the witnesses on this subject is truly droll. Is it, the Act, required more against the masters or against the parents? It is required against both, I think. You cannot say whether it is required against one more than the other? No, I can hardly answer that question. Does there appear to be any desire on the part of the employers that the boys should have such hours as to enable them to go to school? No, the hours are never shortened for that purpose. Mr. Kinnaird, should you say that the colliers generally improve their education? Have you any instances of men who have, since they began to work, greatly improved their education? Or do they not rather go back, and lose any advantage that they may have gained? They generally become worse. They do not improve. They acquire bad habits. They get on to drinking and gambling and such like, and they go completely to wreck. Do they make any attempt of the kind, for providing instruction, by having schools at night? There are a few collieries where schools are held, and perhaps at those collieries a few boys do go to those schools but they are so physically exhausted that it is to no purpose that they go there. You are, then, concludes the bourgeois, against education? Most certainly not, but— But are they, the employers, not compelled to demand them, school certificates? By law they are, but I am not aware that they are demanded by the employers. Then it is your opinion that this provision of the Act, as to requiring certificates, is not generally carried out in the collieries? It is not carried out. 
Do the men take a great interest in this question of education? The majority of them do. Are they very anxious to see the law enforced? The majority are. Do you think that in this country any law that you pass can be really effectual unless the population themselves assist in putting it into operation? Many a man might wish to object to employing a boy, but he would perhaps become marked by it. Marked by whom? By his employers. Do you think that the employers would find any fault with a man who obeyed the law? I believe they would. Have you ever heard of any workman objecting to employ a boy between ten and twelve who could not write or read? It is not left to the men's option. Would you call for the interference of Parliament? I think that if anything effectual is to be done in the education of the collier's children, it would have to be made compulsory by acts of Parliament. Would you lay that obligation upon the colliers only, or on all the work-people of Great Britain? I came to speak for the colliers. Why should you distinguish them, colliery boys, from other boys? Because I think they are an exception to the rule. In what respect? In a physical respect. Why should education be more valuable to them than to other classes of lads? I do not know that it is more valuable, but through the over-exertion in minds there is less chance for the boys that are employed there to get education, either at Sunday schools or at day schools. It is impossible to look at a question of this sort absolutely by itself. Is there a sufficiency of schools? No. If the State were to require that every child should be sent to school, would there be schools for the children to go to? No, but I think that if the circumstances were to spring up, the schools would be forthcoming. Some of them, the boys, cannot read and write at all, I suppose. The majority cannot. The majority of the men themselves cannot. 3. Employment of Women Since 1842 women are no more employed underground, but are occupied on the surface in loading the coal, etc., in drawing the tubs to the canals and railway wagons, in sorting, etc., their numbers have considerably increased during the last three or four years. They are mostly the wives, daughters, and widows of the working miners, and their ages range from twelve to fifty or sixty years. What is the feeling among the working miners as to the employment of women? I think they generally condemn it. What objection do you see to it? I think it is degrading to the sex. There is a peculiarity of dress? Yes, it is rather a man's dress, and I believe in some cases it drowns all sense of decency. Do the women smoke? Some do. And I suppose it is very dirty work? Very dirty. They get black and grimy? As black as those who are down in the mines. I believe that a woman having children, and there are plenty on the banks that have, cannot do her duty to her children. Do you think that these widows could get employment anywhere else, which would bring them in as much wages as that, from eight shillings to ten shillings a week? I cannot speak to that. You would still be prepared, would you, flint-hearted fellow, to prevent their obtaining a livelihood by these means? I would. What is the general feeling in the district as to the employment of women? The feeling is that it is degrading, and we wish as minors to have more respect to the fairer sex than to see them placed on the pit-bank. Some part of the work is very hard. Some of these girls has raised as much as ten tons of stuff a day. Do you think that the women employed about the collieries are less moral than the women employed in the factories? The percentage of bad ones may be a little more than with the girls in the factories. But you are not quite satisfied with the state of morality in the factories? No. Would you prohibit the employment of women in factories also? No, I would not. Why not? I think it a more honorable occupation for them in the mills. Still, it is injurious to their morality, you think? Not so much as working on the pit-bank, but it is more than the social position I take it. I do not take it on its moral grounds alone. The degradation in its social bearing on the girls is deplorable in the extreme. When these four hundred or five hundred girls become colliers' wives, the men suffer greatly from this degradation, and it causes them to leave their homes and drink. You would be obliged to stop the employment of women in the iron-works as well, would you not, if you stopped it in the collieries? I cannot speak for any other trade. Can you see any difference in the circumstances of women employed in the ironworks and the circumstances of women employed above ground in collieries? I have not ascertained anything as to that. Can you see anything that makes a distinction between one class and the other? I have not ascertained that, but I know from house-to-house -house visitation that it is a deplorable state of things in our district. Would you interfere in every case with the employment of women where that employment was degrading? 
It would become injurious, I think, in this way. The best feelings of Englishmen have been gained from the instruction of a mother. That equally applies to agricultural employments, does it not? Yes, but that is only for two seasons, and we have work all the four seasons. They often work day and night, wet through to the skin, their constitution undermined and their health ruined. You have not inquired into that subject, perhaps? I have certainly taken note of it, as I have gone along, and certainly I have seen nothing parallel to the effects of the employment of women on the pit-bank. It is the work of a man, a strong man. Your feelings upon the whole subject is that the better class of colliers who desire to raise themselves and humanize themselves, instead of deriving help from the women, are pulled down by them? Yes. After some further crooked questions from these bourgeois, the secret of their sympathy for widows, poor families, etc., comes out at last. The coal proprietor appoints certain gentlemen to take the oversight of the workings, and it is their policy, in order to receive approbation, to place things on the most economical basis they can, and these girls are employed at from one shilling up to one shilling sixpence a day, where a man at the rate of two shillings sixpence a day would have to be employed. 4. Coroner's Inquests Have the workmen confidence in the proceedings at those inquests when accidents occur? No, they have not. Why not? chiefly because the men who are generally chosen are men who know nothing about mines and such like. Are not workmen summoned up upon all the juries? Never but as witnesses to my knowledge. Who are the people who are generally summoned upon these juries? Generally tradesmen in the neighbourhood. From their circumstances they are sometimes liable to be influenced by their employers, the owners of the works. They are generally men who have no knowledge, and can scarcely understand the witnesses who are called before them, and the terms which are used, and such like. Would you have the jury composed of persons who had been employed in mining? Yes, partly. They, the workmen, think that the verdict is not in accordance with the evidence given generally. One great object in summoning a jury is to have an impartial one, is it not? Yes, I should think so. Do you think that the juries would be impartial if they were composed to a considerable extent of workmen? I cannot see any motive which the workmen would have to act partially. They necessarily have a better knowledge of the operations in connection with the mine. You do not think there would be a tendency on the part of the workmen to return unfairly severe verdicts? No, I think not. 5. False Weights and Measures The workmen demand to be paid weekly instead of fortnightly, and by weight instead of by cubical contents of the tubs. They also demand protection against the use of false weights, etc., if the tubs were fraudulently increased, a man could discontinue working by giving fourteen days' notice. But if he goes to another place, there is the same thing going on there. But he can leave that place where the wrong has been committed. It is general. Wherever he goes, he has to submit to it. Could a man leave by giving fourteen days' notice? Yes. And yet they are not satisfied. 6. Inspection of Mines Casualties from explosions are not the only things the workmen suffer from. Our men complained very much of the bad ventilation of the collieries. The ventilation is so bad in general that the men can scarcely breathe. They are quite unfit for employment of any kind, after they have been for a length of time in connection with their work. Indeed, just at the part of the mine where I am working, men have been obliged to leave their employment to come home in consequence of that. Some of them have been out of work for weeks just in consequence of the bad state of the ventilation where there is not explosive gas. There is plenty of air generally in the main courses, yet pains are not taken to get air into the workings where men are working. Why do you not apply to the inspector? To tell the truth, there are many men who are timid on that point. There have been cases of men being sacrificed and losing their employment in consequence of applying to the inspector. Why is he a marked man for having complained? Yes, and he finds it difficult to get employment in another mine. Yes. Do you think the mines in your neighborhood are sufficiently inspected to ensure a compliance with all the provisions of the Act? No, they are not inspected at all. The inspector has been down just once in the pit, and it has been going seven years. In the district to which I belong there are not a sufficient number of inspectors. We have one old man more than seventy years of age to inspect more than one hundred and thirty collieries. You wish to have a class of sub-inspectors? Yes. But do you think it would be possible for government to maintain such an army of inspectors as would be necessary to do all that you want them to do, without information from the men? No, I think it would be next to impossible. It would be desirable the inspectors should come oftener? Yes, and without being sent for. 
Do you not think that the effect of having these inspectors examining the colliery so frequently would be to shift the responsibility of supplying proper ventilation from the owners of the collieries to the government officials? No, I do not think that. I think that they should make it their business to enforce the acts which are already in existence. When you speak of sub-inspectors, do you mean men at a less salary and of an inferior stamp to the present inspectors? I would not have them inferior if you could get them otherwise. Do you merely want more inspectors, or do you want a lower class of men as an inspector? A man who would knock about, and see that things are kept right, a man who would not be afraid of himself. If you obtained your wish in getting an inferior class of inspectors appointed, do you think that there would be no danger from want of skill, etc.? I think not. I think that the government would see after that, and have proper men in that position. This kind of examination becomes at last too much even for the chairman of the committee, and he interrupts with the observation. You want a class of men who would look into all the details of the mine, and would go into all the holes and corners, and go into the real facts. They would report to the chief inspector, who would then bring his scientific knowledge to bear on the facts as they have stated. Would it not entail a very great expense if all these old workings were kept ventilated? Yes, expense might be incurred, but life would be at the same time protected. A working miner objects to the seventeenth section of the Act of 1860. He says, At the present time, if the inspector of mines finds a part of the mine unfit to work in, he has to report it to the mine owner and the home secretary. After doing that, there is given to the owner twenty days to look over the matter. At the end of twenty days he has the power to refuse making any alteration in the mine, but when he refuses, the mine owner writes to the home secretary, at the same time nominating five engineers, and from those five engineers, named by the mine owner himself, the home secretary appoints one, I think, as arbitrator, or appoints arbitrators from them. Now we think in that case the mine owner virtually appoints his own arbitrator. Bourgeois examiner, himself a mine owner. But is this a merely speculative objection? Then you have a very poor opinion of the integrity of mining engineers? It is most certainly unjust and unequitable. Do not mining engineers possess a sort of public character, and do you not think they are above making such a partial decision as you apprehend? I do not wish to answer such a question as that with respect to the personal character of those men. I believe that in many cases they would act very partially indeed, and that it ought not to be in their hands to do so, where men's lives are at stake. This same bourgeois is not ashamed to put this question. Do you not think that the mine owner also suffers loss from an explosion? Finally, are not you workmen in Lancashire able to take care of your own interests without calling in the government to help you? No. In the year 1865 there were 3,217 coal mines in Great Britain, and twelve inspectors. A Yorkshire mine owner himself calculates, times, 26th January, 1867, that putting on one side their office work, which absorbs all their time, each mine can be visited but once in ten years by an inspector. No wonder that explosions have increased progressively, both in number and extent, sometimes with a loss of two hundred to three hundred men during the last ten years. These are the beauties of free capitalist production. The very defective act, passed in 1872, is the first that regulates the hours of labor of the children employed in mines, and makes exploiters and owners, to a certain extent, responsible for the so-called accidents. The Royal Commission appointed in 1867 to inquire into the employment in agriculture of children, young persons, and women, has published some very important reports. Several attempts to apply the principles of the Factory Acts, but in a modified form, to agriculture have been made, but have so far resulted in complete failure. All that I wish to draw attention to here is the existence of an irresistible tendency towards the general application of those principles. If the general extension of factory legislation to all trades, for the purpose of protecting the working class, both in mind and body, has become inevitable, on the other hand, as we have already pointed out, that extension hastens the general conversion of numerous isolated small industries into a few combined industries carried on upon a large scale. It therefore accelerates the concentration of capital and the exclusive predominance of the factory system. It destroys both the ancient and the transitional forms, behind which the dominion of capital is still in part concealed, and replaces them by the direct and open sway of capital. But thereby it also generalizes the direct opposition to this sway. 
while in each individual workshop it enforces uniformity, regularity, order, and economy, it increases by the immense spur which the limitation and regulation of the working day give to technical improvement, the anarchy and the catastrophes of capitalist production as a whole, the intensity of labor, and the competition of machinery with the laborer. By the destruction of petty and domestic industries it destroys the last resort of the redundant population, and with it the sole remaining safety-valve of the whole social mechanism. By maturing the material conditions, and the combination on a social scale of the processes of production, it matures the contradictions and antagonisms of the capitalist form of production, and thereby provides, along with the elements for the formation of a new society, the forces for exploding the old one. Note. Robert Owen, the father of cooperative factories and stores, but who, as before remarked, in no way shared the illusions of his followers with regard to the bearing of these isolated elements of transformation, not only practically made the factory system the sole foundation of his experiments, but also declared that system to be theoretically the starting point of the social revolution. Herr Wissering, professor of political economy in the University of Leyden, appears to have a suspicion of this when, in his Handbuch von Pratische Staatshushudkund, 1860-62, which reproduces all the platitudes of vulgar economy, he strongly supports handicrafts against the factory system. End note. End of Part 4, Chapter 15, Section 9